none other than comedy. So yay! We have here in the house none other than Amir Zahir, who probably, no not probably, I'm pretty sure he doesn't need an introduction, but I will introduce him anyway. He is a Palestinian Arab American comedian, writer, law professor, radio host, filmmaker, and activist. So let's please welcome Amir Zahir. And I just want to say that I I just watched his um, TED talk on We Are Not White, which is really cool. So please, everybody, watch it if you haven't. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, thanks. thanks. All right, thank you, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, look, you know. Um, so it'll be sort of a mix of stand up comedy and a little bit of uh, uh, commentary, well, podium comedy and a little bit of. Um, Commentary. First of all, it's great to see everybody. Thank you for um, Dearborn Open Mic and the leadership of Wissam and Yasmin for putting this thing together. And I, I guess I'll start by saying uh, Merry Ramadan to everybody. And um, and I'm sort of the opposite of Nada. I am uh, bad at drawing, so I talk uh, for a living. And um, it is uh, May fifteenth, like. Here was said, and uh, I'll get into that in a second, but something that's been bothering me a lot lately is um, these ancestry commercials that they have on TV all the time because white people, are there any white people here? Just a couple? Yeah, all right. Because white people don't know where they come from, so they need to take these ancestry um, uh, tests. And uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, uh, they just have a different conception of race than the rest of us. I don't know if anyone has watched these Ancestry.com commercials. I know, I know why white people do it. They don't do it to find out like what part of London they're from. They do it because they want it, they're hoping it comes back as like 6% black or 7% Native American. So, they, so they're something, because you know, they're nothing. And um, they just want to be something. And if, if you watch the commercials, you can tell they have a different conception of, cons of culture or race than the rest of us. I don't know if you've seen these commercials. You know, our whole life, we thought we were German. <laughs> And I took my Ancestry.com test, and I found out we're 21% Italian. And now we go to the Olive Garden, and we have spaghetti, and you're like, that's not the way it works. I think I understand the way. Um, they have this one commercial. You should look it up. It's, and her name is Kim. Her name is Kim. And she, uh, she's standing in front of all these artifacts. And uh, she says, my name is Kim. And I took my Ancestry.com test. And what surprised me the most is I found out I'm 26% Native American. I had no idea. You had no idea? I, I, I know we're, I, I'm not a genetic specialist or anything, all right, but I, 26%'s a lot. That's like a whole grandparent, at least. I know where my grandmother's from. I know where she's from. I don't need a test. To, I know where my grandmother's grandmother is from. That's part of being Palestinian. We know a lot of that shit. We don't need a test. So they get on these things, and she, let me tell you something, also, uh, to any white people out there, if, if, if you didn't know that your grandmother was Native American, like if they hid that from you, that's not a good story, all right? It's not a, there's not a good history behind that. Somebody stole something, somebody got raped, it's not a good story. I'm waiting for the Ancestry.com commercial where somebody is happy to find out that he's Arab. I'm waiting for that. I don't think we're ever going to see that Ancestry.com commercial. <laughs> Our whole life, we thought we were Puerto Rican. And then I took my Ancestry.com test, and what surprised me the most is I found out I'm 26% Arab. And now we go to the airport early, and we are <laughs> just such bullshit. All right. But today, speaking of Ancestry, today I am Palestinian, and today is May 15th. It is 71 years since the neck, but you have to feel bad for uh, these Israelis. You have to feel bad for them. They have tried everything to get rid of us. Everything. Everything. But we just won't die. Uh, 70 years ago, their militias entered our villages and towns. They came heavily armed and heavily determined to displace and dispossess us. They massacred entire populations. They demolished 400 villages. They stole property. They were ruthless. And from their point of view, they did a pretty good job. They turned about 800,000 pal 800, Palestinians into refugees. We Palestinians call that Nekbi, 
or the catastrophe. We commemorate it every May 15th. Uh, in 1967, Israel commenced its military occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. As a result of that war, another 300,000 Palestinians fled their ancestral homeland. A number of additional villages were destroyed. A couple refugee camps, which were housing some of the Palestinian refugees from 1948, were also depopulated. That means some Palestinians became refugees twice at the hand of Israel in 20 years. That's got to be some kind of record. And we Palestinians call that inexi or the setback. We commemorate that every June 5th. Uh, in 1976, after Israel announced it was expropriating hundreds of acres of private Palestinian land for state purposes, Palestinians called for a general strike and protest. In the ensuing demonstrations, six unarmed Palestinians were murdered by the Israeli military with a hundred more wounded. We Palestinians call that Yom Al-Ard, or Land Day. We commemorate it every March 30th. So, quick review. May 15th, they stole our land. June 5th, they stole our land. March 30th, they stole our land. As you can see, there's a theme. In 2018, between March 30th, that's Yom al Ard, and May 15th, in Nekbe, Palestinians in Gaza protested at the Israeli border every day. About 80% of Gaza's residents, nearly 2 million of them, are refugees from villages that are literally walking distance from their new homes where they live now on the Gaza Strip. Israel murdered 183 Palestinians during those six weeks. They massacred 60 alone on May 15, 2018, as Israelis and Americans were celebrating the opening of the new American embassy in Jerusalem, just an hour's drive away, which Gazans have never been to. We have not come up with a name for that day yet. They've tried all these things to get rid of us, and it, it just hasn't worked out for them. We just won't die. But they've tried more. Settlements, arson, extrajudicial assassinations, killing children, killing pregnant mothers, illegal eviction, the list goes on. They even declared falafel as the Israeli national snack. That one hurts. They've tried everything to get rid of us. In fact, Getting rid of us has really been their only objective for 70 years, and frankly, they're not that good at it. We just won't die. And not only are we stubbornly staying alive, this whole Nekba, Nexi, Yom al Ard stuff has actually made us stronger. Palestinians are the hardest working people in the world. Because our homeland was stolen from us, we have to excel everywhere we go. We don't have an easy fallback. If we mess up, we can't just go back to our country. It doesn't work like that for us. There's no plan B. So we are super successful. We are serial overachievers. We're not just a mechanic. We own the garage. We're not just a doctor. We're the chief of staff of the whole hospital. We're not just a prophet. We are the virgin-born Messiah coming back to save the world from the Antichrist. Big-time prophets. Palestinians are the smartest people in the world. After losing our land, for, for the time being at least, we realized quite quickly that education was going to become our passport. So we got educated, like really educated. More PhDs per capita than any other people, on pl more engineers, more doctors. Not enough lawyers though, we need more of those, especially in our copyright claims on homeless. <laughs> Palestinians have to learn a few languages just to get along. In the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem, getting a good job usually means working for an international organization or a non-governmental organization where one must speak near-perfect English along with their native Arabic. For Palestinians who live inside in, in Israel, Hebrew comes along for the ride too. So, that's right, in the midst of trying to exterminate us, they've turned us into multilingual human beings. To illustrate all these points, I'd like to tell you the case of a particular refugee that I know quite well. His name is George Zahar. He was born in Yaffa, Palestine in March 1948. At one month old, he became a refugee. He grew up in Jordan, starting his education in uh, United Nations schools. Then he finished high school with honors, college with honors, master's degree with honors, and a doctorate degree in chemistry with honors. As you can see, there's a theme. His education got him a professorship then a well-paying research position in America for 35 years. A big house, nice cars, college-educated kids, the whole thing. That's the Palestinian story. From nothing to everything. 
education catapulted my dad from literally a shoeless Palestinian refugee to a spoiled American who opens like, homes like a triple control, seven jet, multifunctional, Bluetooth enabled, state of the art, voice activated shower. I love this country, man. And it all happened because Israel tried to get rid of him. And they weren't good at it. But there's one more thing. Remember how I said Israel created 800,000 Palestinian refugees in 1948? Well, that was true. But they did not get everyone. No. About 150,000 Palestinians remained in what is today Israel. Now, if those 150,000 had increased at the average global population growth rate. Today, they should number about 350, 400,000 people. But they're not 350 or 400,000 people, no. They are 1.8 million. That's right. That's right. That's right. They drop bombs, we drop babies. <laughs> they have tanks and helicopters, but we have the strongest weapon in the world. It's Ramadan, so I don't want to point to it. But we have the strongest weapon in the world. And that population spike is not our fault. When you shut down the roads, deprive us of jobs, and confine us to ghettos, that's a lot of free time to fill. 24 hours is a lot of hours in the day when you're not doing much. And don't forget, 2,000 years ago, we got a woman pregnant without touching her. <laughs> so what do you think was going to happen when we started touching each other? So I guess my message on today, May 15th, <laughs> is this, don't push us. Don't challenge us. We end up as multilingual, super educated, hyper reproductive, overachieving marvels. That's right. 